You are listening to the World Extreme. World Extreme. World Extreme. The World Extreme. World Extreme Medicine. The World Extreme Medicine Podcast. 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 Welcome back to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast with myself, Wayne Walker. In this conversation, we're going to be looking at the role of remote teleradiology with Nico Stromo. So we're interested in doing the conversation is explore the role of remote teleradiology, x-ray and POCUS at a mass motorcycle event that Nico has written up as uh, an empirical paper. So we wanted to explore the utility, limitations, decision-making, benefits, and indeed proof of concept that Nico has demonstrated uh, through this paper and indeed through this event. So the study looked at the provision of a field hospital equipped with a portable digital x-ray and telemedicine to a large mass sporting event in Italy in 2021. So the paper denotes data on patient admission to remote field hospitals and indeed triage, treatment, diagnostic and indeed outcomes that were collected for analysis by the study. So we'll include this study in the show notes of the podcast for your reading. So to do this, I have uh, Nicola Stroma with us. Nico is an anesthesia and intensive care resident at Humanitas University, Milan. He's also an event medicine delegate for CIMAI. It's the Italian Medical Society of Extreme Environments. Nico, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure. Nico, firstly, could I just get you to speak to why you wanted to write this study up in the first place? Well, since uh, since I was a student, I volunteering uh, similar settings and similar competitions with uh, iHelp, which is an enterprise uh, which specializes in uh, assisting with uh, mass gatherings and large sport events. And this actually was the first time that uh, in uh, that we had this type of equipment. So we had uh, the possibility to use uh, portable x-ray. And we were genuinely curious if this was providing some uh, some advantages in uh, in our, our daily job in a pre-hospital setting. There were some publications, but very few, and they were mostly applied in um, home care, or, for example, providing um, x-rays in, um, in nursing homes, but nothing related to sport events or major mass gatherings. So, indeed, it is a proof of concept of um, not only paper, but um, absolute study. So, you do denote the benefits in the, in the study. But before we look at the benefits and, indeed, some of the limitations, could you maybe unpack the event itself? So this was in 2021. It was the international six days of the Enduro uh, where where this study was conducted. Could you give listeners a feel and an idea of how challenging and large this event is? Okay, so uh, the international six days of Enduro is often referred as the Olympics of motorcycle because it's one of the oldest and probably one of the largest events in um, off-road motorcycle. It lasts, as the name says, six days, where they, the riders have to face a wide variety of challenges. They have to be quite versatile, and they even have to repair their motorbikes by themselves with the very strict rules on replacements. The 2021 edition was, uh, was held on a vast area between uh, Lombardia and Piemonte, two regions in the north of Italy. It involved 648 riders and a wide range of workers and, uh, and members of the public. The terrain was rough, and as I said, the area was quite wide. The riders had to run for uh, 1,250 1, miles uh, along the competition. Um, furthermore, um, the local hospitals, according to the possible uh, location of the incident, the local hospital was at least 30 to 60 minutes away by ambulance and uh, the major trauma center from 60 to 90 minutes away. And this is without taking into account the extraction times because these trucks were absolutely inaccessible by, by ambulance. I think that another logistic challenge was also represented by the fact that they were um, evaluated, they were racing on special trucks but the transfer from one track to the other was um, it was taking um, was occurring on public roads, which could be off road or concrete road. But however, even if they were not 
racing, they still had to respect some checkpoint times, and this could lead potentially to to them racing and speeding on public roads, and also and this meant that we had to be very safe very, on the safe side and very careful in uh, checking all the checkpoint time for uh, all the all the racers. So it's quite a dynamic race, Nico. You know, like you said, this this the segments which are on public roads, on then private or indeed disused roads, and it sounds like it. You, it's quite dynamic in 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 nature. Could you maybe speak to sort of the medical provision that you used to sort of match this this dynamic race, and, and indeed, how many X ray and um, point of care ultrasound machines did you have at the event? Okay, the medical facilities were placed in the paddock area. So there was a field hospital with six six beds for uh, minor codes and two beds with critical care capacity. And also during we were during COVID time, so we had one isolation bed. Um, the core of the staff in the hospital was uh, composed by one critical care doctor, two nurses, one radiology technician, and one orthopedic surgeon registrar. Additionally, there was uh, one cardiologist in the team as well. Uh, the field hospital was equipped with a uh, ultrasound machine, which is actually part of our standard equipment, and also with one portable X-ray machine. Uh, the radiology technician was the one responsible for operating the machine, and um, the images were sent via via internet. Via, um, via were sent to a radiologist who was on call in a hospital. So through telemedicine, and then the, the radiologist was providing the report, and obviously we were able to call on the phone uh, the radiologist we had for a question uh, on, on a particular um, image. Next to, the, next to the field hospital, next to the tent, there was what we call the mass event control unit, which is basically a truck equipped with um, some communication and um, uh, dispatching uh, technology. On this uh, truck, we had uh, the, the medical director, two critical care nurses acting as receivers, and then three medical, uh, three medical technicians, three, three technicians acting as a dispatcher. Uh, we have to specify that in Italy, there's unfortunately the pre-hospital environment is still very regionally based. So we needed one technician for one region, one technician from the other region, because as I said, the competition was in an area between two regions, and then one technician from our team in order to coordinate the response. And, um, and this was concerning the, the dispatching center. Deployed in the field, we had the 10 mobile critical care teams, composed by a doctor and a nurse, five basic life support ambulances, four off-road vehicles, and also the hands was available if deemed necessary, but this was activated from the regional system. Um, also, tri uh, triage was uh, made according to three codes. So the code one was the most severe, up to three, which was the least severe. We have also a, co a coding system based on color. So the red one is basically the code one, yellow, the code two, and the code three is green. Because again, every triage system is a little bit different, so it's it's worth specifying it. And in our system, we were supposed to direct the code one and two, so the most severe, directly to the hospital, to the local hospital. And the code three were supposed to come to the field hospital in order to, uh, for us to provide them uh, care. So in the, but you know that then in a pre-hospital, sometimes things they go, don't go exactly according to the plan, but that was the initial plan. So Nico, looking at, we were gonna look at the challenges actually of X-ray machines in the field shortly. And there were some sort of subtle and some not so subtle challenges, um, uh, I believe. But before we do, could you maybe just unpack the case for remote X-ray machines at mass sporting events? Yeah. So 
These events, they usually occur in uh, austere and remote environments. The location of the incident is difficult to access. The hospital is usually far away. Uh, additionally, these events are often rich with medical encounters, in, uh, in particular trauma of traumatic nature. Um, the ideal medical system of these events is the one that is able to treat most of the cases on site. Having a portable X-ray machine helps the clinicians to make more informed decisions because you're able to have uh, a more precise diagnosis. And this implies that we can provide maybe the right treatment on site, reducing the burden on the local healthcare system. And in the same time, avoiding, for example, the patient to wait a long time in the ER. Um, Notably, we have to. I think we have to specify that when we talk about uh, the portable X-ray as a tool, we actually think about the old team. So this technology to be well well used and to provide some advantages, need to have a full team of uh, uh, the radiology technician, the nurses, and the doctors start you know starting the care of the of the patient, and also an orthopedic surgeon to finalize the care of the patient if it's possible to do it on site. So this requires um, uh, a bigger amount of resources and coordination that simply thinking about it as, as a single tool. So looking at the uh, the study, could you maybe speak to the uh, the sample size and indeed, how many patients directly benefited from X-ray or, or indeed point of care ultrasound? Uh, okay, so in um, in the field hospital, we rece received 79 patients. Um, interestingly, 80% were uh, trauma-related. So there was still 20% of patients that were non-trauma. And this was quite interesting because... This shows that in if the competition lasts a little bit longer than a single day, you also encounter pathologies that are in the field of general practitioning. So for example, you have to be prepared to face a stomachache, uh, otitis, and this is something that maybe you don't think about when you plan an event like that. Uh, and also, for, so out of 79 patients, 47 were competing athletes, but the rest, were member of the staff or the public. And again, this is something that was not expected. Um, out of these 79 patients, 31 benefited from, um, so took an X-ray uh, during their care. But I would like to detail this a little bit later because um, also I think having the the ultrasound an ultrasound machine which is probably now a standard of care for uh, all the medical facilities is uh, is also useful um, but we know that uh, taking care of a trauma uh, doing the fast echography for example again is a standard of care but also we had some patients for example uh, with chest pain so being able to assess the contractility of the heart uh, by by uh, echocardiography is obviously extremely useful. And one particular case that I, I found very interesting was the father of, a, of an athlete who came with a swollen calf and uh, we did the, the, the ultrasound of the inferior limbs and uh, we found a, a thrombus. And then we were able to make the diagnosis and to start the treatment directly on site. However, even if I think that um, having ultrasound is uh, the standard of care our uh, our focus was uh, was mostly our focus of the study sorry was uh, on uh, on x-ray machine portable x-ray machine which actually could be complemented with ultrasound because uh, i noticed that the uh, the surgeons the orthopedic surgeons were quite skilled with the uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound which can obviously complement the images for traumatic injuries so looking at the adage and indeed utility of um, of remote teleradiology, so uh, remote x-ray, could you maybe speak to you know, how much it truly benefits the clinician in decision-making when it comes to fractures and or acute trauma? 
Well, we know that when you take care of, uh, of, a, of a major trauma, um, thorax and pelvic x-rays are a part of the standard exams. However, in our triage system, as I said, we, we were meant to transfer major traumas directly to the main hospital. And even if these patients were transferred for maybe a rendezvous for, um, uh, to, for stabilization to the field hospital, they will still have managed, uh, they will still have been um, transferred to the main hospital for definitive care. So I think that in talking about major trauma, it's not a population where you actually benefit for this, uh, for this, uh, from this uh, technology. However, according to the epidemiology of this type of sports, there's actually a study on previous editions in, of, uh, of uh, International Six Days of Ventura, where, uh, where you can actually see that most of traumas, they occur, they are peripheral traumas, so limbs traumas. And this is what we witness as well. And this type of uh, traumas, you, uh, if you suspect a fracture, obviously you would need an X-ray. And if you have the whole team on site, so you also have the orthopedic surgeon, it could, it could take uh, a more informed decision, having uh, the diagnosis, the correct diagnosis, and maybe it can decide to treat the patient on site, providing definitive treatment. And this obviously is a, is a huge benefit for uh, for the patient. And uh, in the meantime, we have to take into account that uh, when we treat athletes, we're talking about a special population. Uh, so we have to take into account the psychological and human, human aspects as well. So this, for this population, uh, an injury can, can, can mean that they jeopardize their, their career. So they're sometimes scared. They just want to keep going. They want, they want you to fix them and to finish the race. And uh, being able to have um, a diagnosis which is uh, more precise with imaging could allow that if they had an injury that was not uh, solvable, was not treatable on site, and they were forced, unfortunately, to seek further care in the hospital, for example, because they needed uh, surgery. Um, if you have the image, if you take the image and you show them that they have a fracture and you talk them through they are more willing to to accept your your decision, and uh, it will be on on the psychological side for an athlete. Uh, I think it's important. So, Nick, you're looking at the challenges because, like you said, it it, it does it is diagnostic in certain terms, and it's and it is quite. Um, the evidence is is very much there to su to support uh, X ray, but it's it's also pretty definitive uh, as well. But there are, it's not without challenges. Could you speak to some of the challenges um, that you denote within the paper? Um, yeah, so there are obviously some technological challenges and uh, organizational. I would say logistical challenges. It's a better better way to express it. So first of all, it's power supply. Um, Luckily, we had uh, access to the local electrical grid. So for us, it was not a challenge. We also had a diesel generator for backup. But again, this is the first thing you have to come to that, that has to be taken into account because the battery of, the, of this machine was lasting uh, four hours in uh, standby mode. And it was able to take uh, up to 100 x-rays. So not bad, but still, obviously, it's limited. Uh, and also the these machines when they are applied in the in the pre-hospital they have to be very light very robust uh, this was 3.5 kilograms very small so and also quite robust so i think it was a good uh, a good tool but again it has to be taken into account one thing that is uh, that is difficult actually is the is taking into account the radiation exposure because we know that the pre-hospital environment is, per definition, a less standardized environment. However, when you use something that emits radiation, you need to, uh, to adhere to strict safety protocols. Um, 
so this is why we decided to have uh, um, a, la a technician, a radiology technician operating the machine because it they are especially trained also on safety protocols and um, to reduce, to mitigate the radiation-related risks. I think, however, there is space to improve the legal and deontological aspects in, uh, for example, informed consent in... Uh, and they have to adapt it to they have to be adapted in uh, in the pre-hospital environment in uh, in our setting what we did is that we created a separate room we shielded the technician and the patient and we tried to use it to let just the the technician operating the machine and to keep it as far away as possible from the other the other people the the other thing obviously is that to have this uh, this machine uh, to make it useful, you need to send the images. So you need Wi-Fi. Uh, we had the two five Gs uh, redundant network, and um, and also we had uh, a satellite uh, system. We were using Starlink basically. If we had again uh, troubles in connection, and also we were in an area where phone was uh, was we were able to also to talk on the phone. So sometimes we had to call the the radiologist to to have more insight on the on the images and this was actually possible so i think these are the main challenges in terms of logistic and you also to know sort of wi-fi challenges as well like reliance on wi-fi like which is good like you said to have default or backups of, of the phone if the wi-fi isn't necessarily working or it's too remote for for wi-fi um but also, like you said, um, it's it's it, moving moving the machines is becoming easier. But only three point five kilograms, so it's really not that heavy. Um, but it is reliant on, like you said, the communication modalities of Wi-Fi, and indeed cellular uh, connection as well to to speak to the to to the radiologist. Could you maybe speak to some of the second and third order issues that you had with with the machines so you know remote consultation could you speak to and then like you said the the, the variety of signals you were getting uh, of wi-fi did how did you sort of overcome some of these challenges well um i was um i was actually we sorry we were actually able to to have connection because we we thought about um, about the fact that there could could have been uh, connection issues in the in in remote areas as as always, so I think that what we should do when we plan events like that is to always have redundancy in the in in the connective systems. So, for example. These machines were able to work very well with uh, with simple five Gs, which now are very very cheap. So create redundancies, have more than one, for example, and um, and then I think you now we you need to work with uh, with a satellite system. So for example, in our case, well, we use Starlink, but um, but again, satellite system is a very good backup backup if five G five G fails. And obviously, um, you have to imagine that you take you take the image, and then you need a, a computer to to use the to to send the image to the radiologist. But again, sometimes the re and then sorry the the radiologist has to provide provide a report, so he sends you an email with the report. But sometimes the report. Uh, you know, even when you work in a hospital, sometimes you want to talk to the, the radiologist because you don't really understand the report or maybe um, you were focusing, you wanted to know something and the radiologist thought that your focus was on another detail. So we, you still have to be able to call the radiologist and uh, to talk about it. And obviously you need, and this is something that uh, we were lucky because uh, we had our, our eager radiologist on the other side, but you need someone that has to be available all day long on the other side uh, of the wire and uh, has to be not busy with other tasks because the re the, the reports have to be uh, provided on time. 
Nico, that's a great point. Like you said, the, the, there has to be that semblance of of uh, planning for um, having someone, like you said, there to interpret the the, the images. Um, so it isn't, like you say, quite as quite as simple. But could I get you to speak to some of the direct benefits of this study, and indeed what the study highlighted in conclusion? Oh, yeah. So going back to the to the numbers, well, we had thirty one patients who underwent x-rays. Out of these 31, 11 had a positive finding. Out of these 11, which were had a positive finding, as I said, five received definitive treatment on site. So they received, for example, bracing, casting, they got uh, their shoulder dislocation reduced, and they had a post-reduction x-ray uh, to control the the maneuver, the realization of the maneuver. And this is quite interesting because they would have gone to the hospital otherwise, and uh, thanks to x-rays, they didn't have to go to the ER. Three were hospitalized because they had injuries that re required surgery. And three received, let's say, first-line treatment, and then they were able to seek medical care according to their preferences. And I would like to speak more about this third category in a minute. Um, of the remaining patients, so there were remaining 20 patients out of 31 with a negative result. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the data. You can download for free the, the articles where you have all the details. But the most important thing is that out of these 20 patients with negative results, seven were able to continue the race. So imagine... Otherwise, they would have needed to go to the hospital, withdraw from the race, go to the hospital, um, spend a lot of time, and then discover that they could have potentially continued the race. Obviously, here we are talking about a very special population. So these people, they they spend, uh, they, inv they invest a lot of time, money, and uh, they train all the time to be there. So you really provide uh, a huge benefit if you allow them to finish the race. And uh, even in the in the category with uh, negative finding, we had three patients who were able to seek uh, to seek care according to their preference. So overall, six six patients were uh, treated. Let's say they received the first line treatment, and then they were um, able to be sent home for a definitive treatment. Uh, we have to realize that this is uh, this was quite surprising for me because I didn't plan it in advance. I didn't thought that, that this was a possible advantage. However, we have to think that these um, competitions are often international. So there's people, most of the riders and most of the people, uh, the, their families, the workers are internationals. They don't come from the from Italy, for example. And if you are able to uh, to let them go home. To be treated, you you give them several, you help them quite a lot because, for example, they can have more affordable treatments. Maybe there is insurance coverage or a government support that uh, let let them have easier access to healthcare. You reduce the logistical challenge because, for, for example, they can have their relatives, their loved ones uh, visiting them in the hospital, bringing them what they need. There is a better adherence due to follow up uh, the the doctors there can access their medical records and also imagine in our situation uh, we were in a rural area in Italy if you sent them uh, a patient to the local hospital nobody or probably few people were able to speak uh, in English so imagine the patient imagine to be in a hospital you don't understand what's happening to you you don't understand the diagnosis they provide you with documents that are not in your native language. Well, this is quite a scary situation. And um, yeah, I think that also, like last but not least, I think this was probably the major advantage that we tend to forget, but this was all occurring during COVID pandemic. So reducing the burden on the local healthcare uh, was probably one of the major advantage.
So Nico, as we sort of finish off and come into land, could you maybe speak to just how cases such, the, such as this can inform the way we resource triage and indeed treat patients in mass sporting events in the future? Well, for example, from this study, we could conclude that if you have um, uh, a large elite sport event, which occurs in a remote area and with a high likelihood of uh, traumatic events, having this portable uh, X-ray technology could make a difference. Um, however, I think that uh, our study had uh, several limitations and uh, I hope that uh, by publishing this study, we will be able to encourage people to go on and uh, go further and let do a larger, well-controlled and uh, study, and maybe repeat it on uh, different type of settings in order to improve the external validity. So, talking about the briefly about the limitations in order to to help other people to better design uh, a study like that, I think that in the future we could we could focus more on uh, increasing the number of patients because our our set was quite small and um, and to do it in different type of settings because obviously this could be useful in a in a setting of uh, high traumatic events but maybe if there's a smaller event or uh, less likelihood of traumas maybe not that useful and i think the second aspect that uh, i encourage people to to look into is the cost benefit analysis because you need, first of all, to purchase the X-ray machine. Then you need to maintain it and has to be all, always calibrated. You need to have the full team operating the machine. So for smaller sport events, maybe this with a limited budget, this could be quite cumbersome. Um, a solution to that maybe could be uh, to show that you're actually uh, just don't just think, take into account the, the the money per se, but you're actually saving resources for the public health care system. So a solution to that could be maybe doing a partnership with the local health care organizations, seeking sponsors, and maybe the athlete can have their specific, uh, their event insurance, which covers uh, radiological diagnostic. And uh, I think that in general, these, these studies are, are useful because, well, if we, if we don't, don't discover stuff like that, we cannot improve uh, the quality of the, of the pre-hospital care. However, something that um, it's very difficult, I think, in the pre-hospital care is collecting data because the resources are limited by definition in, uh, in the environment. And uh, if you plan in, in the planning, you say that you want to allocate a staff member for data collection. Well, people will look at you as you are wasting uh, resources in a, in a moment where resources are very needed for taking care of patients. However, if I think that if we don't collect data, if we don't analyze them, uh, we don't realize uh, what we're doing wrong and maybe what could be, where's the room for, for improvement. So maybe we could uh, we could do some brainstorming, uh, share ideas, and also what we are trying to do is to move from a paper chart to electronic medical record because obviously it's way easier to to extract data. And um, but again, this is quite costly. So maybe for small organizations, uh, this is not worth it. So I think this is something that has to be explored further in uh, in other studies. And I think that. If we want to look into, into the future of uh, why these studies could be useful in the, in the near future, well, we have uh, in 2026, there's uh, the Winter Olympic Games in the north of Italy. And uh, technology like this, for example, could be very, very useful. I think absolutely to your point, Nico, the, 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 the real utility here is the remoteness of the medicine you're practicing just negates the on those fringe cases which there's plenty of you know is it a sprain is it a strain is it a fracture 
you know, having definitive diagnostics at point of uh, of consultation is absolutely powerful because, as you said before, the nearest hospital may be an hour, two, three, four hours away, and it's it's to allow better decision making at point of consultation is absolutely powerful in these dynamic events and it's it's very empowering as well for the clinician um and hopefully like you said it could become a standard of care in the future but proof of concepts um studies such as this need to occur as you said so there could be um studies with with more power more more sample size um to really start to look at the external validity and look at whether this could be part of the standard of care for mass events mass sporting events but it's a fantastic study we'll put it in the show notes of the of the uh podcast uh so that listeners can read it and thank you once again for joining us thank you very much that's been a real honor thanks for listening to the episode Please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to. Please also head over to the World Extreme Medicine website where you can find more engaging content on extreme medicine webinars and indeed the collection of courses from our global network, including humanitarian, disaster relief, expedition, space, military, tactical, and performance medicine. Thanks again. <laughs>